Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church of Lawrenceville. Uh, Whether you're here in person with us or joining us online, we're glad you're here as you are. Confident that God will not leave us the same before this hour of worship ends. Uh, If you are new among us, especially if this is the first time that you're worshiping with us, we'd love it if you could look in front of you if you're here in person and find the connect card, a little card in that rack in front of you. Fill that out, put it in the plate as it comes by so we can stay in touch with you. And if you're joining us online, put your name in the chat uh, so that we can know to greet you and drop us a line using the contact form on our website, again, so we can stay in touch with you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, As always, I won't read everything in the bulletin, but highlight just a few things, uh, trusting that you will read that bulletin thoroughly. There's certainly a lot going on, especially this time of year. Um, But uh, first of all, I want to thank all those who personed, manned tables yesterday, uh, intrepid souls, uh, you, at the uh, Arts Festival. I know it was pretty hot, and uh, we are grateful for your service. Uh, We had three tables, one for the church and create and relate, one for the preschool, and one for community well. So thank you all for doing that. Also, I wanted to make everybody aware that our alternative service uh, that begins at 1130 started last Sunday and will continue through June 5th. So if you want to try that service, and especially if you want to invite somebody to come, Uh, It's a multi-generational and uh, more sensory and creative kind of worship experience that follows the Presbyterian worship, uh, Presbyterian liturgy. Uh, So check it out some Sunday between now and June 5. As you know, we always end this time with the the moment for generous living because we like to lift up uh, generosity and acts of generosity among uh, the people of this church. And so today I want to lift up those who are members of the Maidenhead Society. Uh, the Maidenhead Society consists of people who've uh, made a, a, a committed to making a gift as part of their legacy. Its mission is so much more simply to help people as they think about all of their resources, especially the resources uh, and how they'll distribute them when they're no longer living. Um, those names are not published because we will, we're hoping that there might be others who join. Today there is a brunch for members of the Maidenhead Society as a thank you, but it's also for people interested in what that's about uh, and curious about estate planning in general. Uh, and so please, there are extra spaces there. Uh, if you didn't RSVP, we'd love it if you could join us, and that's in the lounge, the air condi- air-conditioned lounge after worship immediately following this service. Just join us there. Friends, let us move from getting here truly to being here as we worship God together. Thank you. Friends, we are uh, reminded, as hot as it is today, that this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? Amen. Now, calm down. This is a Presbyterian congregation now. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, yes. All right. And I'm assuming all of you worshiping online are just as animated as we are in the meeting house today. Let us together worship God. gathered to praise our gracious God. Please join me in prayer. God of light and truth, though we see a dim reflection of your glory in a simple budding flower or in the sweet rain on a spring evening, you are in truth beyond our grasp or conceiving. Before the brightness of your presence, the angels veil their faces. And so with lowly reverence and adoring love, we acclaim your glory and sing your praise, for you have shown us your truth and love in Jesus Christ. But although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have used them for selfish gain and to oppress others. 
Lord, we are truly sorry for how we have failed to live as instruments of your grace and peace. Be merciful as we confess in silence our personal sins of commission or omission. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, I'd invite you to join me in standing in body and or in spirit as we receive the good news this morning. May the light of God's love flood into our hearts this day. May we feel the healing presence of God in our lives. And may we accept God's love and God's hope for us. For this, friends, is a gift freely given by Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. The good news of the gospel is that in Jesus Christ, we are loved, loved beyond imagination. We are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. you may be seated and children please do come forward for the children's message and offering the children's message is Maya's mom and Quinn's mom Miss Ferguson yeah, I got it. Thanks. hi everyone I'm so, I'm so happy you're here Annie Tommy I have a question for you here's my question do you know what this sign symbolizes? Yes. Oh my gosh, that's such a good thing. It, it does look like a turkey foot through a microscope. It does look like a turkey foot through a microscope. Open your imaginations, people. And it's the first thing that Tommy said, which is also a peace symbol. So. I'm going to read from this book. Who knows what this book is called? The Bible. And Pastor Jeff is going to preach from the Bible like he does every Sunday, or one of our pastors preach. And he's going to preach from the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels. And I want to have you guys listen for the word peace. It's going to come up. We saw the symbol. So listen with your ears. Ready? Ready? Jesus is saying to his disciples, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Keep listening, here it comes. The Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. <gasps> Did you hear it? My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So in this, Jesus is talking about peace, but he talked about something else. Jesus said, the Father and I, the Holy Spirit, we are going to come in and make our home with you. Now this is a very, very <laughs> sad <laughs> Maya's heart is hurting. 
This is my version. This is my version of a house. So my, my Lego skills are a little bit rusty. But Jesus I have, like, I know. I cannot wait to come over and see your house. So Jesus says, I'm going to come and make my home with you. So that what? So that we will have peace. And so this is what happens. Sometimes in our lives, we are sad. Maybe our pet dies. Or maybe a friend gets sick. Or sometimes we're worried because we haven't heard from someone. We don't know how they are. Or we're, or we're sad because something happens. So every time these things happen... Our house seems to fall apart a little bit. Like, see how all these pieces are coming off? We get worried, we get sad, and it feels like our house is breaking apart. But what did Jesus say? In the house, I'm making my house new. What do I give you? <gasps> Peace. It's there. If you sometimes you have to dig really, really far through all the hard things when we're sad and when we're lonely and we're angry, but at the bottom inside is what? Peace. And that's what we get from the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that no matter what we are feeling at any time, if we dig really, really deep, you are there with your peace and your love. Thank you. Amen. All right. Now, the adults say, the Lord and the children say, Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. A reading from the Gospel of John. Let us listen for the word of God. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away. I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I begin my sermon, I think it's important for us to mark in our worship what happened last weekend in Buffalo. You know, uh, Karl Barth said we should do theology with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Perhaps he could also say we do theology with a history book in one hand and the Bible in the other. You may be aware that a number of us uh, are part of an effort to uh, encourage the state of New Jersey to come to terms with the history of slavery in this state. 
We're also trying to do that same thing in this township. And next fall and spring, we as a church are going to engage in a pro process of looking at slavery as it relates to our own congregation. And so let us take a moment to remember the victims in Buffalo, but more importantly, perhaps, let us ponder the why of their victimization. Let's take a moment and be in silence for them. Amen. My grandmother was a missionary in Africa. She uh, married Harry Neely. My grandmother, Elizabeth Neely, ma married Harry. And uh, Harry attended Princeton Theological Seminary just down the road there. Elizabeth, my grandmother, graduated from Worcester, one of the first women to graduate from that college. Uh, and she accompanied him, Harry, in his missionary tour to the Cameroons to seek to proclaim the gospel with the people of that nation. Uh, my grandfather died of a brain tumor when my mother was very young. I never, I never knew him. And after returning to the United States to attend to his funeral, my grandmother decided to go back to the Cameroons and finish his missionary tour, and then some. She spent several decades uh, as a woman missionary, as a single mother uh, in the Cameroons. It's where my mother grew up. And I came to know my grandmother through... Uh, family reunions we would have every year. She forced all five of our children and their families to come together the first year uh, by force of will, which was very strong, let me tell you. And uh, after that, no forcing was necessary. We all loved getting together. And so I got to know my grandmother through those formative experiences every year at our family reunion. And she was, she was a very serious woman, but she was a very loving woman. She loved me. She loved me way more than I deserved because I was quite a hellion when I was a kid. When I announced that I was attending seminary, uh, I, I became the only one among my 18 cousins, her 18 grandchildren, who uh, continued the tradition of ministry in the Presbyterian Church. And so then the checks started coming every other month, 100 bucks. But the weird thing is, I feel as if I came to know my grandmother Neely much better. I got a clear picture of her after she'd gone, after she died, um, through what she left behind. First of all, through the memories that she left behind. She, be, she became kind of a, uh, a legend, a larger-than-life uh, figure in our family gatherings after, through the memories that we shared about Grandma Neely. Um, I came to know her so well through those. But also through what she literally left behind. I, uh, I possess some of her writings, her journal, and her Bible study notes. And several years ago, I took time to read them. And it's so interesting how you, you feel like you know somebody, but then you read something like that, they're, they're intimate, personal thoughts, and then all of a sudden they come into much greater focus. And I realized that I am who I am because of my grandmother Neely. Her love of Jesus had become my love of Jesus because of what she left behind. Maybe you've experienced that, that, that too, uh, you get to know somebody, somebody comes into clear focus after they're gone, after they have died. Certainly, because of the work I do, that, that's been my experience many times. I come to know people through my pastoral ministry with you. I, I become friends with people. I, I come to know them, their life. But then uh, when somebody dies and I get to hear memories from their family and their friends, it's very interesting and almost miraculous that their life comes into such a a greater focus. Uh, they take on added dimensionality through that process. I had no idea she was a champion fisherwoman. You know, I had no idea he was a major league baseball player, that kind of thing. Sometimes we can see people more clearly when they're out of view. This text from John 14 uh, should feel familiar to us. I think probably some of the language might have felt familiar to many of us because it's language that we often use uh, during a funeral or a memorial service. 
And we didn't read the most familiar part of John 14 when, when Jesus says, uh, uh, there, are many houses, there are many rooms, there are many, uh, in my Father's house there are many mansions is the traditional language. In my Father's house there are many rooms uh, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to show you the way to where I'm going. Uh, we hear those words all the time at funerals because this part of the Gospel of John is about Jesus preparing his disciples for his death. It's part of the farewell discourse, a long section of the Gospel of John in which Jesus is trying to teach his disciples what his death and more importantly his resurrection mean. But they don't get it. Now he's right there in front of him and he knows that they don't, they don't get it. They don't understand. They're befuddled. And this is a theme throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus says something spiritual and ethereal and the, in dunce-like fashion, the, the, the disciples don't get it. You know, I mean, uh, how I must be born again? How am I going to get back in my mother's womb to be born again? That kind of thing happens throughout the Gospel of John. But this passage of scripture is about how Jesus tells his disciples, you're not going to get it now. You're only going to get it later on. He says in this passage, a little while, the world will no no longer see me because the world's going to crucify me. But then you will see me. Other, Other times he says, in a little while, you won't see me. And then you will see me. That's the paradox of the thing. The only way they're going to see him is when he's out of view, when he's gone. At which time... Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit comes to the disciples, and it's only then that they get it, after he's gone. I will send send my Spirit to remind you of what I have said, so that on that day you'll know you get it. We only know Jesus uh, by looking behind which is the clearest view, because of his legacy. I mean, let's face it, there are people who were with him, but they didn't get it. And there are people who witnessed his resurrection, and they told other people, the only way we receive what is most valuable in life from Jesus is through his legacy, what he leaves behind. In a way, It's an advantage not to have seen him, not to have seen his resurrection. Maybe you remember Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe unless I see the marks on his hands, unless unless I see it for myself. And then Jesus says to the disciples, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And what he means is they have an advantage because their imagination and mind is not solidified, reified by seeing the actual thing. They know it through the testimony of the Holy Spirit. We know Jesus because of the legacy that he left behind. We see him more clearly that way. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought about your own legacy and what you will leave behind? Because in many ways, people are going to get a clearer view of you when you're gone. And so this is a Sunday when we talk about legacy. And what we leave behind. It's a Sunday when we have to talk about death. We need to do that as Christian people. Uh, To acknowledge, look, we're all going to die. The death rate, 100%. We've come from dust. And we're going to go back. And this is why life is so precious. You know, if you ever read Greek mythology, the Greek gods are just terrible. They're dastardly and awful. You know why? Because they live forever. Nothing is at stake. Mortals, not so much. As a Christian community, it's important for us to remind ourselves of that so that we can be good stewards of the preciousness of life, but also so that we can be good stewards of death. You know, this is a whole passage about Jesus preparing his disciples for his death and his resurrection to teach them about the meaning of his death, which they only understand by looking back. And so it's important that we prepare the people in our lives and ourselves for our death. One of the things we can do is very simple. We can prepare for our funeral. I don't know how many of you you have done that. 
Uh, but whatever stage of life, it's a really good idea to do that. You can do that today by tuning into our website. Just go to the worship tab, and there's a thing called funerals at the bottom. There's a great booklet called Last Acts of Love that has very clear instructions for how to plan your funeral. The people you leave behind will appreciate it. It will also be a way for you to express your wishes about that. But there are other things I think we have to do, we ought to do in preparation for our death. And one is to think about what are the intangible things that we leave behind. This, this may seem like a sermon that's geared more for those in the last season of their life, but it's really not because whatever season of life, we are preparing a legacy for ourselves, parenting. I mean, I don't know how many times in family life I, I say something that my dad said and it becomes part of my family life. And so as we're, as we're going about creating a family and nurturing it, we're creating a legacy. What are people going to say about you when you're gone? What are they going to remember? Maya Angelou uh, once said, I think this is a great quote, at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. So something to think about. What will people remember about you? And what is it around that that you want to leave behind? But this is also important, and this is where we come home today in this sermon. What are you going to do with the tangible stuff of your life? Because you can't, as the, as the cliche goes, you cannot take it with you. What are you going to do with the possessions and resources that God has gifted you in this life? Because what you do with it after you're gone says a lot about who you are. And today is the, the time, the Sunday, when we talk about this. The resources and possession God has given us and what we do with them. Um, I want to make clear, though, that what I am saying about this is not about twisting your arm to give a gift in your will to Mother Church. That's great. And certainly the church needs that. And by the way, just a little side note, there are oftentimes I hear, oh, the church is just after our money. And I want to clarify, no, if we're after your money in any way, it's because we care about you. You know, how we use our money says a, a tremendous amount about who we are and our spiritual life. I've said so many times by now, like, what we want is generosity for you, not so much from you. So it's not just about giving money uh, to the church when you die. It's about helping people think about what their values are. Where do you want your, your money to go? Maybe you want it to go to the ASPCA or the American Cancer Society. There are smart ways to do that, and there are smart people to help us think about that. Today, Bill Hart is going to help people think about legacy planning, just the, just the beginnings. But it's good stewardship for us to equip each other as a Christian community to do it right and to do it in a smart way. Um, but, but often, I, you know, I, I hear uh, when people say, well, the church is just after our money. I, I like to remind them that, look, you went, most of us went to college for four years. And they certainly are not shy about asking you for your money and even, a, you know, a gift when you die, Right. Why shouldn't the church that cares for you from cradle to grave encourage you to think about a gift that will enable others to experience that kind of care? That's what it's about. What we leave behind says a tremendous amount about who we are. And people are going to see you more clearly uh, by what you leave behind in so many ways. By the way, if you want to come and talk more about this and, you know, free uh, financial advice that is really on target, there's a place for you. We have extra spots in the lounge. Just join us afterwards and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not free lunch, it's free brunch. So come and join us. But it's how we roll as Christians to try to equip each other to be responsible and faithful in the use of all that we're given by God all of our resources, life and death. So finally, as I think about my grandmother Neely and what she bequeathed to me, the fact that I am who I am in 
many ways because of her, but not just because of her, because of so many people who have given me so much. I am the recipient of so much generosity. My grandfather never would have been able to afford our first house without his literal legacy to us. I am who I am because of other people's generosity. And it inspires me to do the same. I want to end here. Think about this building. Think about this place. And by this place, I mean you, this community of faith. We didn't pay for this. This comes to us courtesy of people whose names we never knew. Of people we never knew. That there's going to be a building that we bequeath to future generations. But all of this has come to us as a gift. And so the best motivation for giving is not being arm twisted for God's sake. It's because we're grateful. Because we realize all that we have been given. That's why to give. That's why we ought to give. And so remember, folk will see you much more clearly in the rearview mirror through what you leave behind. And now it's our turn. Amen. standing and join me in the affirmation of faith printed in the order of worship. Let us affirm our faith together. This is the gospel which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Friends, just a reminder, as we come to this time of prayer, if you're here with us in person, on the back of those Connect cards is a place where you can request prayer, and you can place those in the offering plate as that comes around later in the service, uh, and know that we do lift up those requests each week, uh, and we are a praying congregation, and we pray for one another. If you're with us online, please feel free, if you're comfortable, uh, to lift up your prayer requests there in the chat. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have gathered this day indeed to celebrate the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. He said to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. But how many times are we troubled and fearful, O oh God? We feel hopeless in the face of an uncertain future. We turn on the TV to the news of gun violence and hate and racism, and we're overcome by fear and anger. We read about the rise of COVID transmission rates, a one million death toll, the stigma around mental health, shortages in baby formula and food insecurity, and our hearts are troubled. And still many of us feel an overwhelming sense of hopelessness as we approach yet another election cycle the commercials and the ads starting back up. Help us, O oh God, to place our trust in your love. Open our hearts to see the wonder of your eternity. Release us from anger and loneliness and despair and bring us to the realization that in your love we may find peace and joy. Remind us of your ever-present Holy Spirit. Remind us that by the Holy Spirit, we don't just look forward to a dwelling place for us, but that you dwell within each of us. And by your Holy Spirit, may we be reminded that you are at work in our world as we keep and obey your commands to love one another. And so by your Holy Spirit, may we continue the work which you have started in Jesus Christ and to that which we have been called to in our baptisms. And all things, may we continue to bear witness to your grace and your love in and for the whole world. By your Holy Spirit, may we continue, uh, excuse me, uh, and by your Holy Spirit, we do pray for the world. We pray for its leaders and its people, and we pray for your church and its witness in the world. This morning we pray specifically for the Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church as they struggle to understand the loss of one of their own when they ought to be celebrating. For the staff and congregation of Geneva Presbyterian as they put pieces together and the whole Laguna Woods community as they take in the madness of such an event. We pray for those who were injured silently naming them as unknown, but knowing, God, that you know them so well. And we pray for the family of the person killed. Lord, we grieve with that family. We pray that you might comfort them with the peace that you promised, that peace which we don't yet understand. We pray the same for the families of the 13 victims in the Buffalo shooting. We pray for all of those who are the victims of racism and hate. We pray for justice. We pay, pray for peace. We pray by your Holy Spirit that you might teach us a better way. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our peace, and our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, we have been given a gift in Jesus Christ, and we've been given a gift in the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit reminds us of all that Jesus said and all that he taught us and all that he did. It reminds us that we are loved, dearly loved, by God. As we reflect this morning on the faithfulness of God and that which we've been called to, as we've heard and been invited to think of our own legacy, we come to our point in our worship now where we are invited, where we invite one another uh, to give back, to respond in faith, to share, to be generous as a way of offering ourselves and our worship to God. And so as the ushers come forward, I'd invite us now to continue in our worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. pray. Giving God as spring bursts forth its blossoms and witness to your move, your movement, that you bless us from generation to generation with the new life of Easter faith. All that we have and all that we are come from you, O God. So gladly we share this offering that others may too be blessed. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
All right. I uh, would invite Connor to come forward. Uh, you'll notice in your order of worship, uh, we are welcoming. I wanted to appear taller than you. That's what, no. I just, I want, I'm going to be Connor's supervisor, and so I feel like this is a good posture. Just <laughs> Uh, you'll notice in your order of worship, we've got a brief bio there and uh, some commissioning questions. Uh, and uh, Connor will be beginning an internship with us, uh, actually this week, uh, and will be, his academic year is somewhat shifted so that he can graduate a little, uh, technically not early, but early. Uh, you'll have to ask him about that later. Uh, so uh, before we get to the commissioning, I'm going to give you, Connor, a chance to introduce yourself. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Connor McCraney, and as Kyle said, I'm in my final semester at PTS. Um, I'm originally from Roswell, Georgia. It's about 45 minutes northwest uh, of Atlanta. Um, went to college down in Birmingham, Alabama, a small school called Sanford University. Um, and then, but I actually went to high school up in, in Newtown, Pennsylvania, and so Spent a lot of time at Newtown Presbyterian Church, which may sound familiar to, to some of y'all. Um, got to work with them a good bit. And anyhow, I'm just really excited to, to be here, um, to get to hear your stories. I think the beautiful thing about being a church is, uh, as a community, we all have a story to tell. And so over this next semester, or let's not use that word, but over this year, um, I look forward to kind of getting to talk with each and every one of you getting to hear your stories and kind of what makes you all the type of people that y'all are. So I'm excited to get plugged in and do some ministry with y'all. And Connor, Connor will be serving as our pastoral care and connections intern. Uh, and so you may be getting a phone call from Connor or he might drop in, he might make a little house visit. Um, and you, you don't have to be sick. Uh, you, it, it, we just, I'm going to send him out. We're going to just draw members' names randomly here. Just kidding. But maybe. All right. Well, uh, you know, we'd like to uh, commission Connor for his ministry among us here and, and worship. And so, Connor, I want to remind you that the grace bestowed upon you in baptism is sufficient for your calling because it is God's grace. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in faith and to commit our lives in ways uh, that serve Christ. We believe that God has called you to this particular service as our pastoral care uh, in turn. And so we now commission you with the following questions. And you'll notice there are questions. We want to make this interactive. So where it says congregation, you will ask Connor, and Connor will respond, and then Connor will ask us a question, and we'll respond. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I will, with God's help. I do. I will, with God's help. And will y'all support me and encourage me in this ministry? We will. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you. You know, it's too bad. We're two weeks past uh, Louise's retirement. We've got another person here who's saying, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> All right, y'all. All right. Connor, you, wait, before you go, uh, you have formally been commissioned, and so we bestow upon you the coveted PCOL name tag. Uh, wear it proudly. All right. We could give Connor a round of applause as a sign of welcome, and if you stick around during fellowship hour, we invite you to uh, welcome him. Uh, more intentionally. 
In the meantime, the peace of Christ be with you. Uh, let's take a moment uh, to greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace, and if you're with us online, you can share a sign of peace in the chat. Or a turkey foot under a microscope. Let me repeat once more the invitation. If anyone wishes to join us in the lounge to talk more about legacy, please do. There's, there's a space for you. If you are joining us online, we are putting in the chat the Zoom link uh, with which you can join us for that gathering too. Friends, we talk about death as a Christian community only to affirm life. The idea that because Christ rose again, we shall experience a resurrection like his. Now, we don't know what that's like, but we do know and we do trust and have faith that when we die, we do not die. And so we go forth from this place in that hope. And so do that and share that hope with a bruised and broken world in the name of Christ. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and community of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us now and forevermore, and let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.